Hello, I'm Sally Wiener Grada, and this is What If? Why Not? How? Where I ask people who have interesting stories and ideas, questions that are on my mind. Joining me today is Rabbi Cantor Michael McClowski. I contacted Michael after learning about a class he'll be teaching through the Hebrew College calling, called Do Gollum's Dream of Electric Shoals, which is one of the better ripoff titles I've ever heard, in which he'll be looking at Gollum's Through the Ages using Hebraic texts, Jewish folklore and literature, plus science fiction to explore the moral responsibility of modern creators of technology, particularly of AI and robots, and also whether such beings have agency. How could I resist? He's hitting so many of my interests in one go. A bit about uh, Michael. Since 2007, Rabbi Cantor Michael McClowski of Temple Emmeth of, of Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts, has utilized his lyric tenor piano skills, facility with composing, and passion for teaching to inspire the communities in which he walks. He has quite a few credentials. I'm just going to highlight a few of them. His continuing education courses given through the Cantor's Assembly, Hebrew College, and elsewhere have included such diverse topics as peacemaking and dispute, the Torah of music, and Jewish approaches to women's reproductive freedom. Thank you for that one, Michael, among others. With his partner, Dr. Ray Feller, he runs a yearly film series called Cantor Plex, which, he, which highlights Jewish films from around the world. Among his many other endeavors, Michael is a member of the Hebrew College's School of Jewish Music as a cantorial coach, and he serves on the conservative Mazorti Movement's Committee for Jewish Laws and Standards. Uh, for those who are purely American, Mazorti is the conservative movement around the rest of the world. Welcome, Michael, and I'm Thank delighted you. you could find your time and your busy schedule to join me today. Thank you for having me. What an opportunity to talk about the, the Golem and so many other things and intersections. So. Yes. Um, before we get started, let's start mm -hmm. with the basics. Please tell us about Golems. What are they? Why do I give a damn? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, the first time we encounter this word golem is in the Hebrew Bible and in, in Psalms. And um, it, we're, it's actually referring to God seeing um, this sort of amorphous, not fully formed, but still having power, you know, sort of Tellurian power, a connection to the earth um, that will eventually become a human being. Uh, and so that's really the first time we hear about it. Um, as time goes on uh, with sort of apocryphal literature and the early rabbinic period, we begin to hear about uh, stories and to see the rabbis explore what it means to be humid, or excuse me, to be not humid, but human, to be um, what it means to um, create a humanoid. Um, what is, um, what defines something that's real and human? Is it, um, is this being someone that speaks? Um, what is this simulcrum or this, um, this, this golem a reflection of? Um, and we see over time, you know, all the way to this, the probably the most famous story, which is actually, um, uh, I would say, sort of ghost written by a, a rabbi, Udo Rosenberg, um, of the Maharala Prague creating a golem. Uh, we really see that the golem is a reflection of the, the consciousness of, of what it means to be human, what it means to be real, what it means to walk in the world and have agency and, and to sort of confront violence. It's, it's, it's a, a story that really covers what it means to be, to, to sort of live in my space and live with others. And of course, I believe what you're referring to as the first mention is the creation of Adam, which um, is the word, the name Adam means of the earth, right? Uh, it, it's, yes. It's, a, yeah. a, and, and so it's Adam, our, our supposed forefather, um, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily evolutionarily, but uh, spiritually and such and mythologically, is um, made of clay. Yes. So, so why See. shouldn't human beings be able, we're, we're capable of making anything, why shouldn't we also be godlike and create a being yeah, made well, of clay? 
That absolutely, yeah. So, so we have this this word Adam, as you as you aptly pointed out, right? It's related to Adama, to to the earth or the soil, and it's related to Adon, to the red, um, sort of the red clay. And so, um, you know, there there are all of these stories about Adam, this primordial um, human being being created out of the earth. And there's even one beautiful passage in in the Midrash where Adam is or, or Adam is created. Uh, out of the uh, the earth that will become sort of the uh, the altar of atonement, um, and what a sort of wow. feckin beautiful image that uh, perhaps the golem in some way can evolve into something that is an act of healing between us and the earth, and and also you know we one of the we have this famous verse right in Genesis, not say Adam but Salmina Vakin Mutenu, let us make the human being in our image and our likeness. So we have like. It, it's a great question. Who is the we in this case? Is it the royal we? Is it, as Rashi says, the ministering angels? Um, one interpretation also is that God is addressing the earth because we're made of these earthly elements. We return to the earth. Um, and there is a, perhaps a, I believe that there is sort of a, a soul or sort of some, some kind of um, spirit that's animating us too. That's beautiful. Um, as you just said, I have long believed and uh, actually talked about a lot about golem literature as being vehicles for helping us understand who we are as human beings. Um, the approach that you appear to be taking in this class seem, mirrors that, but seems to go even further. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you feel that a study of how golems have been represented through the centuries is important today? That's Wow. Okay. So it's, you asked the very profound question. I'm going to try to give a fairly succinct answer. So I see it um, because I, I think aptly as the, the golem is both um, sort of human being and reflection. Mm -hmm. um, it's both the human being and other. And we are famous human beings for both drawing people near in relationship and othering. Um, and I think that we see the gold golem in some ways as a safe way for us as human beings to sort of play with the idea to mold, if it, to, you know, pun intended, because we love, <laughs> as I love puns. So, and, and uh, um, to sort of mold this idea of what what does it mean to 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 be human, and how can I um, create something that is that speaks to a need, but is also not encroaching on other space. And so we see over time, you know, sort of the obsession with the golem and speech. And then we see eventually, um, you know, the idea of the golem, uh, this, I think the first time we see it is with, um, with uh, Besheva Singer, we see the golem enlisted into the army. Uh, and we see the golem as sort of something that can be, uh, can not just run amok, but be, can be co-opted to to hurt other human beings and this desire um, for weaponry, um, and then in Wiesel we see the golem as sort of this liberator and savior um, in a sort of uh, a, a post Holocaust um, uh, sort of God with the God connection between God and human beings is is severed or frayed, uh, and then we see the golem having love affairs, um, uh, and we see you know us struggling with human beings about what does it mean to love and how does it mean to let go. It's it's really uh, um, it's amazing to me. It's it's, it's moving, <laughs> very moving. Um, I'm just also very curious. Uh, you made the leap from all this wonder of humanity to yes. a discussion of the morality of the new technologies that are evolving today and not just evolving but they're already starting to take over a lot of what we do yes so could you take us a little bit further on that uh tact? yeah so um well first of all uh as you aptly noted um <clears throat> there's the philip k dick reference in um in the title of the course, uh, you know, I I think that uh, there is a desire of human beings to mold created human beings in anthropomorphic ways. Uh, and so when we do that, we take, depending on the person and their background, their biases, um, we create in our own image. And so I think 
we have this idea of sort of the creative, constructive impulse, uh, and we also have the uh, this destructive impulse, and we we see it uh, us wrestling with it not just in quote unquote high culture. Um, but also in quote unquote low culture, although I really enjoy all of it and and really see it to me as as profound. Um, so we see this with like War Machine and Iron Man and Tony Stark um, dealing with his mechs. Uh, we see this in the work, you know, the work of uh, Norbert Wiener. We see this um, Philip K. Dick exploring this in in his fiction. Um, we see this in Gershom Sholem, the great Jewish mystic, who 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 wrote an essay about uh, the computer being the the golem and um, this magnificent and awe-inspiring power, how can it sort of run beyond, it? what is the way in which it runs amok? Um, and uh, I, one of the ideas that I'm flirting with right now is the idea, I think that as human beings, we're so obsessed with analyzing data and with categorizing, um, with the sort of putting people into boxes and categories. Uh, and, you know, that's in a lot of ways what we're using um, sort of AI for now, right? To sort of manipulate. Uh, but what if we used, or I should say, you know, we teamed with AI in a way that was co-creative. Um, and that's, uh, and um, that was based on something that was relational. And that's kind of the interesting, I think that's the, the big issue we're wrestling with as human beings. Um, I really hope that we have enough wisdom. Uh, I sometimes, I'm not sure. So, I um, one of my concerns that have that goes not so much into morality and ethics as into who as into the evolution of being a human being and what it means to be a human being um, that I fear is that um, the creative instinct that we have the ability to think creatively is what not only has defined us but has allowed us to grow as communities, as brainstormers, as synthesizers of ideas that, to create new ideas and new things. And if we team too much with AI, or if AI usurps a lot of our creative needs mm -hmm. by just providing, it, it's, it's pablum in many cases, but just providing whatever salve our mind needs to feel creative, that we are going to lose that ability to evolve as human beings. And that's one of my great fears. Um, it, it, um, it's been focused very much by the creative community on the issue of copyright, but it ha it's even more than copyright. It's the ability of human beings to think creatively. And uh, I feel like golems represent that a lot, that it has been our ability to create and to think beyond what is. Um, yes. It's that's just one of my pet peeves right now. Is I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, I think the the idea of the boredom is important. Um, I mean, Abraham Joshua Heschel said, I and mean, we can think about boredom in terms of creativity, but also in terms of prayer. Like, in order to do boredom is okay. If we wanted to have a spiritual practice, we have to have regularity and we have to have discipline, right? And we also have to boredom is important. That's what leads to imagination. Um, and um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think my my wife is a is a, a dean of students at MIT. Uh, um, uh, she works in student, student support services, and this is something with ChatGPT. This is something that's very much on the minds of professors, and and uh, so absolutely, yeah. Yes, boredom and silence. I agree with you on that. To be able to rest within it. Um, now. We have so much going on right now in this world related to AI and robotics. Uh, you're you're um, facilitating these kinds of discussions. Do you see anything concrete that could come out of these kinds of explorations that might actually affect our future use, our future uh, handling of these technologies? Is um, I understand it's a beginning point, but in your imagination, where does it take us? Wow, that's a fantastic question. Um, I love that. I, so I, I would, I would say we can turn to primary text. I think in a way, um, and and I'd love to see you know one of the the most important things I think we can offer is a sense of ethics. Um, as mm -hmm. you know, ethics and technology really should be going hand in hand, and we really as um, as educators, rabbis, cantors, ethicists, um, creators 
artists, we need to be able to sort of anticipate mm -hmm. um, and really be in touch with what's happening. Um, you know, one of the great, one of my favorite authors, uh, Margaret Atwood. I mean, you can really see in her fiction, like in her speculative fiction, it's she is really anticipating things um, or sort of at the forefront of things. If we can do that and we have these sacred texts to rely upon that can really engineer, again, pun intended, conversations um, among uh, among involved parties. And I, and I think really, ideally, it should be artists and scientists and technologists, rabbis, priests, imams, people, uh, people of, of many different um, ideas and, and with very rich uh, material to really kind of talk about these questions. Um, and um, in some ways, we have the technology to do it in a very very simple and in an easy way. I mean, this this is something where we really have the possibility of connection. So I guess th that would be a first step, I think. But mm -hmm. um, we have to figure out ways to um, to sort of come together and have those conversations. And one way I, I hope to do that is by um, is by teaching. And I've got a very wide swath in this class that I'm teaching. I have a you know a student who a former student of mine who's doing his doctorate in computer science at, at UC Berkeley. And he's worked in it. He started a robotics company and I have rabbinical students in the class and I have um, artists and I've got, um, or, um, you know, someone who's, uh, uh, who's involved in rhetoric and working with them um, at teaching in a school of diverse needs. And so it's, it's really, um, you know, quite a, a wide swath of people. Sounds like uh, it's the beginning of a conversation that I would love to see you perhaps open up into something of a uh, forum or perhaps a uh, conference. That would thank, be thank you. Uh, that would be marvelous. Are, are you considering such uh, uh, it's a, prospects? It's a great question. Um, so it, one thing I will say is that um, there are lots of great organizations that are beginning to do work with this. Sinai and Synapses, um, you may know too, with Rabbi Jeffrey Middleman, mm -hmm. um, is doing a lot of work with this already too. And so he and I have been in touch. Um, my hope is to do some work there with it. Mm -hmm. um, the American Jewish Studies Association, um, I bl believe that one of my st former students just sent me um, uh, their next issue is all is going to be about Judaism and AI. Um, and they mentioned particularly the Golem story um, and uh, sort of has something to play around with. So I hope to submit to that. But um, I, I think we're you, there's just a giant um, article in Moment magazine, right? Yes. There is. Um, so I think it's very much on people's minds. And I and I think that um, if all these forces kind of come together, it'd be intriguing. I'm curious, though. Um, Things have been happening very quickly in the past year on AI. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering if we are too late. Are the discussions like this a bit like closing the door after the horse has bolted? That's a great question. Um, I, I don't know if we're, I mean, I think we're not too late, but I think that we have, it goes back again to my earlier point that we really need to be, um, you know, uh, I've been teaching about the golem. I've been my in my pulpit for 15 years, and um, but I think now people are ready to hear. You know, I would sort of teach about it in the past, and people would say, "Oh, you know, it's kind of a fun, fun story." But now it's something that feels very real. And when the technology catches up with the myth, um, and then I so I, I think it's not too late. I think that there is a lot of creativity left in human beings, and there is the ability to love. Um, and I think that. Um, uh, but I, but I think we have to, as teachers and, and engaging people, we, we have to, we have to embrace and we have to run with it. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, uh, on your perspective as, uh, let me make sure I have the term sure. correctly, uh, serving on the, uh, conservative movements committee for Jewish laws and standards. Sure. Um, how do you envision a moral and legal approach to AI and robotics that might actually work? in our global corporate society? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a tough question. So I can definitely say, what I can say is this. Um, uh, I started on the committee uh, in this last spring. Um, and uh, I, I can definitely tell you that there are some, uh, there's some responsive literature that, um, particularly a rabbi, Daniel Nevins, that does address this. Um, um, and actually using the Golem story as sort of a, a primary text um, to 
uh, sort of look at um, self-driving cars, artificial intelligence. Um, I really, um, I, I, I hope that we're going to to, to do more of this. Um, but I think it's it's halacha for me the idea that. You know, literally, we would talk about Jewish law, but it really is sort of a way of of living and engaging with the world. Mm-hmm. I, I believe that it's it doesn't belong in an ivory tower. It's something that really has to be taught um, and engaged with. And and so I think that is really the approach. I think we're really seeing that this is the approach of the um, the committee. And I I think that there's a real desire um, to to sort of open up these ideas. And I I think that these are questions whereas you know kashrut may or may not speak to um to 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 certain jews i think the idea of of ai um or um machine learning or um you know our relationship with technology is is very much present um in in people's lives and and feels relevant um, whatever one's affiliation is in judaism yes and kashrut uh just for those who don't know it's uh the uh, laws and practice of being kosher, uh, living yes. kosher, which includes food and other issues. Um, I just like getting the definitions out there. <laughs> I, thank you for clarifying, and I and I so appreciate that. And, yes. and even and, and I say kosher too is you know how it depends on how widely we look at it. Yes. It may actually really appeal to people. It's again, it sort of depends on what 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 our sphere of influence is and, and right. how wide we want to go. Yeah. Um, what last thoughts would you like to share about golems, developing technology, our future? Is there, please share with us. Yeah. Um, so I, I would just say that, so first of all, that Joseph Dan, the, um, the great uh, scholar, scholar of mysticism and folklore, he said that the golem is the most profound story and myth that Judaism has given in the 20th, 20th century. And, um, you know, now we're in the 21st, of course. Um, I think that there is something in terms of the creation of a story and the way we, we sort of deconstruct it, reconstruct it. Um, that is, um, you know, narratives give us agency. Um, and, um, the way in which we the way in which we tell our narrative so there's something really profound um i think in this idea and michael shabon and others uh really yeah. talk about this and 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 i also think that you know the golem is interesting because in in some iterations right and it really depends on the author um you see in ellie wiesel's that the, the golem and and also um uh sorry i'm just having a mind blank for a second i'll i'll just um where did I put the? Uh, oh yes, this is one of my favorites. Um, Francis Sherwood, the Book of Splendor. Oh. Um, it's it's absolutely beautiful, and the golem is is something that is almost what we idealize humanity would be. Um, sort of something that is protective and relational, and and loving, um, and so I, I, you know, I, I just. Um, I think there is a, we have that side of the golem, and then we also have this side uh, where we sort of see it as a golem, right? We see it as sort of a, um, or in Israeli slang, they say "hatichat golem," like a pure, like a piece of kind of clod, like a piece of meat. How do we, uh, um, you know, how do we, as Jews and as human beings, how can we understand greatness in a way that has to do with a with diversity? Of, um, of styles of learning that doesn't have to, that isn't elitist that has to do with um, desire for love and and reciprocity of fostering relationships um, without sort of labeling the other who thinks differently than us um, mm-hmm. or or as a as a as a clod um, you know we look at even in Pirkei Avot we have sort of like this magical story of the golem and then we have in Pirkei Avot we have um, you know who is uh, like who is the wise person and who is the golem? Who is right. the claw? Um, uh, so, and the reality is, I think we have been. It really all depends on context. Right. We are both the wise person and we are the claw. It's like the four the four children, um, right? So, yeah. uh, um, I think there's there's a sense of honesty and 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 there's. I would just add one other thing that there's a there's the there's another Talmudic passage where. 
um, we have this this root used. That's um, and the word I believe is glima, which is is a cloak. It's used to a cloak uh, to refer to a cloak that a, a sage would wear. Yes. Um, and I was thinking a lot this morning about like the idea of cloak and mask. Um, and the, this really the golem, the story itself is a mask um, for uh, all of the sort of juices bubbling in the human consciousness and mm -hmm. and us wrestling with our with our um, with our, our yetzer hara and our yetzer hatov and so our creative darker creative um, impulse that is also necessary and yet at the same time sort of how we sublimate how we come together what do we use our creative juices for. So. And this does uh, apply very much to AI and robotics, very much. Yeah. How are we yeah. going to do it? And how, how are we going to allow it to do to our world? Um, thank you so much, Michael, for joining me today. While the, while the Golem um, class is sold out, unfortunately. No, no, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, sorry, uh, my mistake. It's, so it, it, it is filled, it's going to happen, but uh, I think that people could still register. So. Oh, how wonderful. So, so, yes. So they go should go to the um, Hebrew College uh, website, go to adult learning, as I understand it, and just do ser a search for the word golem. And you will, oh, I wish I had the time to sign up. I know it's going to be a great class. Oh, I would love to learn with you. And, and it's, uh, I, mean, I, I would just say that if people, they can also contact me directly um, if they have questions, and I can also direct them if they have any trouble getting to the right place. And uh, now, uh, Michael is available on his Cantor McClowski Facebook page. Which also has links to his SoundCloud because he is a musician and a poet. And I have to go listen to some of your uh, musical poetry. And you can reach him, as he said. Uh, his email is cantormichaeldavid at gmail.com. He has other classes coming up this uh Oh, uh, this October, October 25th and 26th on Zoom. It's uh, Lichy Lach, go forth, walking with the shakers and destiny makers we call the matriarchs. That's definitely right up my alley. And another course called Water in the Cracks, Miriam as a Model for Transform Transformational Leadership, which will be in April. They both sound fascinating. Thank you. As for me, my new collection of feminist science fiction of Being Woman, which recently, which was recently published by a Noble Fusion Press, includes a story called Chiroscar, in which an AI aches to understand what it feels like to be human. Another new book, Daughters of Eve, an, an essay-based discussion works book, workbook that uses the stories of women of the Hebrew Bible to explore who we are today, will be published uh, this December by Byatt Publishing. And incidentally, since we're talking about Golem stories, this spring I will be conducting a series of book discussions about the literature of Golems and other artificial creatures at That's the great. Rosenbach Library in Philadelphia. We'll be starting with Frankenstein, and we'll have an opportunity to view the Rosenbach's collection of rare books and materials related to Mary Shelley's masterpiece, including a first edition. And when you go, when you when you go into the Rosenbach to the to see there, they actually let you handle these things. It's it's just fabulous. You, you have to come to Philadelphia to do this, do one of their tours. As always, you can connect with me at sallywienergrada.com or on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, and probably soon on Blue Sky. I keep on meaning to go there. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, everybody. Thank you.